Okay, let's move on to the second section of how to rig using Skyrig, which is dealing with the weights on the character. I've done kind of a quick job here to pull the uh, top vertexes of the control, FK control systems for the arm out. Okay, so let's begin with the second part of this, which is how to weight up the characters that you have created and rigged up using Skyrigger. I've grabbed some control vertices of the FK controllers and just pulled them roughly outside the body so at least you can see them. I usually prefer to scale so that you can grab them from any angle. Um, these you can only grab from certain angles. If you're under here you can't see it very well, but you know, for the purposes of kind of getting on with things, as long as you can visibly see them when you're animating and the character is hard shaded, then uh, that's that, that should be adequate. So with the character, uh, I don't press 6 in the top of the number pad because that shows the texture. It gets a little distracting. I like to go back to 5. And uh, I frankly also like to have wireframe on shaded in this because you can actually see the divisions of the lines if need be. It's a little clearer than just hard shading. So for painting weights, Maya has already put um, some of these, some of the, the, the bones have been given agency over each of the uh, control vertices. And as you crawl up and down these control boxes, FK control boxes, you can see what sections of CVs have been given uh, that influence over the, over the mesh. So <clears throat> this is a nice way to sort of gauge how to paint the vertices, uh, especially when you go into areas that are uh, supposed to be gradual and um, you know not supposed to be uh, jarring. But one of the areas that I think is the most currently the most jarring is the fact that just due to proximity alone, which is how Maya uh, doles out influences of CVs, just based on proximity alone, something like the head is shared half with the head control bone and half with the neck control bone. So that's Slender Man creepy right there. So let's go back to zero. And I want to show you how to paint weights. Now, how you paint weights is that you... Uh, can either come up here to uh, rigging and go down to skin and you get the paint skin weights tool always go to the options for it otherwise it won't show up as a um, as a control panel and secondly if it comes in docked like this and you wanted to move it out just grab these double lines at the top of the title and drag them out and you should actually now have a uh, free rotating panel if you want it to go back in you just sort of move it near the top and when you see things shift that means Maya is ready to accept this as a docked panel again, so it depends on your workflow. Personally, I like to have this thing floating around so I can move it off screen if I don't need it that much. Um, so this is the, the tool settings, and it deals with whatever mesh is selected. We have no mesh selected, so come into Windows, Outliner, and you can always select Dude Mesh, like so. And um, you can also make sure that the character, the mesh is not referenced in the layer. You turn that off and now this is going to be perfectly selectable anytime. I like to have it on reference uh, and select it here in the outliner because it's just a little cleaner. Keeping it in reference for me makes sure I don't accidentally select it unless I need to. And the second way you can bring up the paint skin weights menu is with the mesh selected. You right click anywhere that is sort of uh, furthest away from the control um, the FK control, NURBS controls, and just right click on the mesh, hold it down, mm -hmm. and you should have a drop down menu that says paint skin weights tool, and it'll come up just the same. Now this is filled with every single bone that is inside dude's skeleton. Ignore skeleton FK, that's just sort of a, uh, a midwife to the IK FK process. Uh, what we're concentrating on is dude skeleton, or whatever you've given your character skeleton. This is the one we're looking for. This is the one we are going to be um, weighting to the skin. So each of these joints has been given some control of the mesh and that is by a version of um, uh, degrees, percentages, decimals. And the easiest way to understand that is that every one of the joints is now listed here and if you've turned on a nice little bit of business called um, x-ray joints and you have your joints visible it will draw the joints outside of the character's body there we are so we have these corresponding colors now to um, 
the colors that are inside of the uh, character's mesh. So I'm gonna once again do this, paint skin weights, there we are. So as we go up and down the character and we select the joints, the bones, you're going to see made um, manifest, although let's not use color ramp because by default it's black and white. Um, you're going to see that it's made uh, clear to you what vertices are, are stuck to that bone by a black and white map. And the whiter that map is, the more influence that bone has. Okay, so we go down here to leg. You can see it's got a lot of white going on, joint hip. Not so much, sort of residual white, probably from what the legs have left over. And uh, the hip and the root, of course, has a little bit left as well. So this is kind of the easiest way to see how Maya has doled out influence of the mesh. And since we want to fix the head, we have the ability to um, come up here to the bone list and use this keyword area, which if you type in uh, star, wild card is what we call it, shift eight, it's that little star, and then head, star, uh, well we haven't named it that, it's probably, there we are, capital head, it will just show the joints that have this word in it. So it's a really nice way to find the joints you're looking for um, quickly. And if we click on that joint, we can see, ah, it is currently, it has this much influence over the mesh. You can also turn this off if this is bothering you, wireframe on shading. <clears throat> so when we want to paint these weights, uh, oh, of course we have to have it selected for this to work. We want to paint these weights, so it really makes no difference. Um, we need to see the joint, we have to have the joint selected because this cursor is now a paintbrush as you see, and it is going to interactively paint over all the vertices, not the polygons, not the edges, but the vertexes, the points at where these edges meet. And as you paint over it, you're going to automatically give more influence to the bones selected over those vertices. Uh, and that's of course with these modes selected, paint and replace is on. And I also have it down to um, uh, not post, but interactive. So make sure that that works. So, um, you also get the chance to use this color ramp if you desire. The color ramp is a little more detailed. If you turn it on, you can see the values that are closer to white and black. The hotter the value, um, the more influence it has, and the cooler the value, the less influence it has. And it has a certain granularity that people can, um, that, that's a little more visible to, for people because black and white is kind of what degree of white is that? Is it 50%, 25%? I'm not quite sure. But colors are a little more obvious, and there's more of them to uh, let you know exactly what you've, you've uh, uh, it's a little easier for people to understand what has more um, weight or influence. I'm going to stick with black and white for now for the purposes of this tutorial because I want to start painting. So as I, as I hold down my left mouse button, I'm going to paint over these vertices. As you can see, the, the white popping in these uh, vertex places as I drag over the, uh, the sort of nexus of the lines. And this is basically giving the head joint, which I have selected, head joint, uh, more influence over this part of the head. Well, this is pretty cool, it's a little slow. Well, hold down the B button, B for boy, and see your cursor change to a left and right arrow, and hold down now your left mouse button simultaneously, and when you drag left or drag right, the circle, i.e. your uh, brush will increase or decrease in size. Be careful, this can go crazy quickly. Maya is uh, pretty much trying to guess what part of the surface you are on according to the camera view. So you can see that circle sort of pop in 3D over the head. And I'm going to go over the top here and just sort of paint things in. This is a good way to see the effect of what we're doing, but it's not a good way to see the influence because everything is straight. Uh, what I like to do for test purposes is come down here and increase my timeline. This little trick that should help you um, weight this character out a little better. I like to come down here to the timeline and make give this a timeline of say, let's say zero to um, 10. So zero to 10, 
And at zero, I'm going to save the key for this rotation exactly where I want it. Or I can just press S. And then I'm going to come out here to 10, and I'm going to physically move, or rotate rather, that controller. And it's going to put a different value on there, and I'm going to press S again. So now I've got, when I use my left mouse button to drag here in the animation uh, timeline, I've got one constraint going left and right. And this, uh, although it looks particularly creepy right now, it is helpful when we grab the mesh and we come back into paint skin weights because now as I continue painting the influence, you can see it sort of pop to where it should go. And that doesn't make a, you're not really seeing the effect here because this part of the head is sorted out nicely. It's this lower jaw area that looks sort of creepy and um, like it's not quite going with the bone that it should. And that's exactly right. It's, it's sharing an influence with the neck. And the neck is stationary, so it doesn't know what to do. It's sort of taking those vertexes that are the character's mouth, and they're giving half an influence here and half an influence in the neck, so they're sort of half twisting. And that's why it looks so weird. Um, one of the advantages of painting is as you paint, you can see that as the influence gets slowly ported over to 100% of the, of the head joint, the character's head slowly goes into the position you need it. Now this is going to be tricky down here because we have very few vertices and you can start to overcompensate and put in influences in the neck that you don't mean to. So this is going to be a bit of a, um, of a trick to come in and try and paint the character entirely to influence on one bone while not necessarily compromising it to uh, another bone. Luckily, there's a couple of controls here in the, in the weighting that you can use. One is that uh, the opacity and the value can be sort of messed with, which is that if you want to go to the value, the, the majority of the value you can paint uh, is currently one, which means I can take all the ones being influenced by the neck and give it to the head. But I can also say, uh, if I type in value 0.5, that I am not able to take, take um, or influence more than half. 0.5. See that? It's sort of like um, it's giving some of these back to the neck because I'm painting half values now. And I don't necessarily want that, but it's a good way for me to um, go over an area and not uh, delineate that it's either one bone or the next. I can sort of do this half work, as it were. So um, this is also important down by the areas of, uh, let's say, the lower body. So we've got such extremes of the legs, and I'm going to now hide the joints because we don't need to see those anymore. We know what, what's going on, and uh, we're kind of going to concentrate pretty much on the mesh. So just like we do with the head, you can come in here and go to zero controller uh, timeline and just press S on the FK controller for the leg. And then at 10, you can take and go into your rotation controls and rotate that leg up. And you can see that our issues are kind of in here in this hip area. And if you want to expand your timeline to 20, you can press S for the knee. And then at 20, you can keep that leg up and you can bend the knee. Like so. And what's going to happen here is it's going to go up and it's going to bend down. And we can see that we need to definitely start helping out this leg because look, it's lost all of its calf mass because there's um, an unequal ratio of what's affecting the pant leg and the calf. So coming in here, selecting skater mesh and coming into the paint skin weights tool, we want to keep our painting exclusively to just the, the lip of his pants. And how do we do that? Because things can get so crazy so quickly. Well, one of the ways you can do this is um, you can, before you start painting, you can either decrease the size of your brush or you can come in and go to component mode, just like when we bring up paint skin weights tool, you can go down to vertex. And this allows you to select vertices that are along the, um, the mesh. Now, unfortunately for this, there's an order of operations that Maya is going to default to NURBS curves first. So you want to turn those off you know, layer control, just make them, uh, don't make them visible anymore. Then you can turn the, uh, the mesh layer out of reference. 
and you are allowed to grab just the vertexes. So coming in even closer to make sure that I have an exacting, um, very precise way of grabbing just the vertices that I want. So I can go around this particular object and grab each of the things that constitute the lip of this character's cargo pants. Okay, so we've got just that lip. That's great. Um, going back into the Paint Skin Weights tool, uh, we no longer want the head. We want to look for, I believe, leg. And you don't have to do it this way either, even though this quickly brings up joint right and left. Uh, you can just go down with nothing in this keyword search and just look for uh, what, you're look, uh, what you want, which is the dude joint right leg. Ah, it is the wrong one. We want the left leg. There we are. All right, so what we can do now is uh, Maya is constraining our uh, the influence of what we paint to the selected vertices. So I can paint over here, it's not gonna affect it. But the minute I come up here, it's gonna pop all of these vertices very quickly to one bone. And it's gonna keep that hard edge, which frankly, I'm not sure we want, but it is good for the demonstration purposes of showing that you can quickly just paint over a series of vertices to, um, to give it full influence over one leg bone. Uh, we don't necessarily want that, so let's go back to the value 0.5 and do the same thing. And this means that we have a, we're gonna have a nice sort of half and half sharing of those vertices to um, the leg bone and maybe the knee bone below it. So some of these vertexes also are hard to paint when you can't quite see them. Um, what you can do is of course stay in wireframe. Just press four, go to wireframe. Uh, the other thing you can use is this tool called flood, which means I want you to flood the vertexes that I've selected with a 0.5 value. So it's a way to quickly stamp everything and you don't have to paint over it again and again and again. It just just sort of smashes it on top. And you can tell that that's, that's, that's a pretty nice 45 degree uh, angle, which is unrealistic in pants, but it helps us because they need to allow for an opening for this leg. Uh, our next concern is the fact that things are so compromised in the calf, in this area right here. So coming in really close and grabbing just the calf muscles. Okay, cool. Ooh, nice little stick leg there. And then we can right click, go to Paint Skin Weights tool, and we're gonna go down one level to the knee. Um, these need to be 100% on the knee because they're losing their mass, having this sort of halfway point between two bones. So I'm gonna come in here, uh, change the value to one, and then flood those. Boom, now it's got its mass because it's being controlled wholly by the, um, the knee bone, which is fine, because the knee rotates and then it just affects the entire calf below it. So you can come in here and continue painting um, and saving these values so that you can check rotations and paint them out, see if there's too much going on. It looks like if I were to look at this character's hip, uh, and I were to look at the, I don't even need the controls now. I mean, animate one that I can make it invisible. Uh, if I want to show the joints and concentrate on where that joint is right there, when it goes up, okay, that's fine, but it looks like it might be compromising these three vertices here. So I can come into show and just turn on and off the joints or turn them on and off here and just go up and down my time slider to gauge. That's, that's a little too extreme, these three points right here. Um, so I'm going to grab just those three points, or, or I can just paint over them without grabbing those three points. Uh, it's just that I like to be very, fairly precise. So this goes to leg, this goes to hip. I frankly think hip should have a little more influence over these, because it's the whole hip. And you can, by the way, not select any vertexes and just paint over the body as you see it needs it. Looks like his, uh, his, this guy's behind is going a little too much with the legs as well. So without selecting vertices, I go to the Paint Skin Weights tool and go to the hip and just paint this area. So it just kind of pops back. A little too extreme. Okay, let's go to 0.5. Let's see if we get this kind of smoothing, as it were. <clears throat> also, there is a smooth tool when you have a lot of different influence that tries to sort of average them out. 
So this is a nice way to try to getting a nice um, uh, halfway point. And you can, uh, we've only done sort of the, the one side of the body and we've done uh, the left side of the body, which is fine because when we go back to our original pose here, we can grab the controls for mirror skin weights, bring that up and now use this to our advantage. So uh, using mirror skin weights is, is pretty good. The character does have to be symmetrical and you do have to determine, again, let me reset the settings. You do have to determine exactly what plane this mirror will be in. Uh, since Y is up and Z is out toward you, that is the plane we're looking for in this case. You need to um, select either close of point on surface. You can test out raycast. But if you were to mirror this, as I've just done, it doesn't look like anything's really changed. But you won't see that change until you come in and grab the controls for the right foot. If you've done the left half, and you grab that controller and you rotate it up equally. And then you rotate the knee down and you should see that the calf muscle stays fairly consistent which was the endeavor with the other one yeah i could use some massaging in there use a little bit of love with the painting of the weights but that's a good way to um, do a lot of work on say the arm and down here in the knee and the foot and then have that transfer over and just do some cleanup okay so let's go into the last part which is using a yoga animation file um, we have set some keyframes here on the legs to kind of check out their deformation up one at a time and down. We've done the same thing with the head. Uh, once we want to get rid of those, you can do this one at a time by simply clicking all of the animated channels, then right click on the names and go down to uh, break connections and we'll get rid of them. Go to the top of the rig, like so, which is bring up the outliner, grab dude control and now go to, uh, sorry, under edit, bring this down a bit more. <clears throat> Under edit, you've got keys and cut keys. You go to the options uh, below what you have selected. And since it's the top, it's going to cut all the keys for everything below for the entire time range. And now nothing should be animated. Uh, I do not like to use, by the way, delete keys because sometimes the keys are in fact part of the control systems for a rig. Maya has a very wide definition of what keys are, and you want to be very specific. So now that we have this character kind of um, unanimated, but standing there, I want to talk about the possibility of using an existing animation file. This is what I've used previously. One of the advantages of Skyrigger is the fact that it is a program that creates quite literally the same rig every time. There's not a lot of variation on how it's constructed. There is a lot of variation on the options and uh, variation on the bone placement. But as far as uh, the naming convention, the hierarchy, everything is the same. And there's a particular advantage to this because what Maya does in this case is it allows you to animate something, to export it, it understands the animated hierarchy, and if you read it in on the very same type of hierarchy, the animation will still work. So what uh, I've done to test some of the rigs is I've animated the character over a series of like 1,200 frames, just arms raising and then knees raising and then feet raising. And since I want to check this rig out, especially when I'm still painting the weights, that might be a good way for me to uh, cut and paste the animation to speed up weighting. Do you need this? No, you don't need this, but it is some, an option you can use if you are using the same rig time and time and time again. And that's um, specific again to Skyrigger. This animated file will not work with other animated files because they are um, constructed in a different way. And Maya knows only hierarchy. Let me explain the idea behind it using a Photoshop file here. Um, the hierarchy that you've got going on has these controls in it. This could be a hierarchy for anything, by the way, bones. But in this case, we're dealing with constraints. So the hierarchy of constraints are, are set up in a particular unique way. Uh, and thus your animation, when you finish it, is going to be attributed to this part of the rig. Your arm animation will go on to the arm control, the leg animation, etc. And as long as things are matched, as long as you have a one-to-one -one ratio, then this animation, when you save it out, can come in. And this animation being explicitly verbatim, like this uh, system here, the animations will transfer and then they will work. 
Um, however, there is a way of doing it that's not going to work if your uh, hierarchy is now done in a way that you have an additional part and you've put the constraint for it here and it's messed up and pushed down the constraint for the finger. Well, the problem is, of course, the animations don't understand that and they're going to uh, instead go on to these controls. And so the animation for the finger is going to go to the gun. It does not do it according to name. It does it according to the order of the hierarchy. This is at the top, this is at the top, this is below it, etc. This is below it, etc. That's all that Maya understands is the branching hierarchy and the design. It does not go by names. So if the constraint has been pushed lower, it's going to paste this animation onto the constraint system incorrectly if you've saved it using a different hierarchy. Uh, as long as you have the addition at the very bottom of your previous hierarchy, then that's fine uh, because your, your concentration now is about on creating a constraint that lives outside of your existing hierarchy or at the bottom so that when Maya is done cutting and pasting it says, well, I have nothing left and it leaves it alone. So just keep that in mind when you are um, cutting and pasting these animations. Secondly, what you want to do for uh, Maya to make this uh, possible is it does not naturally have the animation exporter uh, enabled within uh, the default setup of Maya. To do that, go to Windows, down to Settings and Preferences, and go to something called the Plugin Manager. You should get a very large uh, list of things that allow you to uh, enable plugins that come with Maya, but were you to enable all of these, Maya would take about 15 minutes to load up because it has to load all of these different plugins to work. So a majority of them are turned off by default. Um, one of the things, the, the one you're looking for in this case is Anim Import Export. Make sure it's not just loaded, but auto load, meaning it's going to load in from here on out every time you bring up Maya because it's really worth it. Uh, now what you can do is, let's bring up the outliner. So go to the very top of your control here in the outliner is the only way you can be sure you're at the very top of your control. You could in the 3D view say, hey, that looks fine. Um, you need to make sure you're at the very top or grab a controller and just press the up arrow key until you can't anymore and you should be at the top of your hierarchy. When you go into file import, go to the options, you should see an option for anim import at the very bottom. Scroll all the way down, anim import. The, um, the, the different options you want to make sure are on. Take off preserve references and use namespaces and then continue scrolling to the bottom. This is crucial. You need to turn on clipboard. Copies should be set to one. Copper adjustment, preserve, paste method, replace. This is going to read in animation. This is going to replace everything you have. It should not work in tandem with existing animations. It should um, replace it entirely and make sure that that's what you have selected. Replace region, um, just say entire curve. And after that, you can go to import and it will ask you where to go. And this yoga animation is downloadable from the uh, web page as well as from Blackboard. From here you can import it and it should read in automatically. It doesn't look like anything has happened, but you need to first of all increase your timeline to something around uh, 200, probably more like 500. And when you go to your timeline and scroll, you now see that this character is magically dancing. And that's because uh, you now have read in successfully an animation that allows you to take a look at um, all of the joint rotations uh, with an existing, with a previously uh, animated uh, file. So I've just brought up the graph editor here. I'm grabbing the last keyframe at it. It's at 650, allowing me to come in and type in 650 and knowing that's the exact end of the animation. So this is a great way to come in and start animating your, um, or using animation to check the validity of your weighting system. And when you come in, also there's a bit of the animation missing. You need to make sure that you are on top of the IKFK blend. I've left that as a challenge for the individual rigger. And you can utilize that to pretty much check all of the different bone systems uh, using Sky Rigger. And 
The point is that when you uh, enable the Anim import export in Maya, if you know that you're going to be dealing with a different rig every time or that you have a particularly problematic rig that you've animated once to check your uh, rotation values or your, your weighting, then you're able to save that out and read it in uh, in the future. So this is, this is intentionally done where I've just rotated one part of the constraint system at a time throughout a range. And if you want to use this in tandem with the move lister so that you can actually set up all of the ranges so you can check things like uh, neck, head, whatever, you can do that. I personally think it's much easier to just take the, the time slider and truncate it to the area that you want. So let's say, for instance, the arm's going up and down. That's kind of what we want. That goes from, say, 50 to 77. Type those values in, 50 to 77. And suddenly, it's just going to deal with that alone. And you can focus entirely on weighting one side and then transferring it over. This is certainly a problem area. Or you can simply go through, and if you want to be very uh, consistent in your work, you need to make sure that you've got um, all of the paints done by hand. And that's, frankly, that's, that's my preferred method. I think it's much easier to go through the character and make sure that you've got everything done by hand rather than wait on um, assuming some automated process like Mirror will do it for you. So uh, this should help with the idea of how to paint weights. It's one system. We're going to be going into another system, uh, which is going to be using spreadsheets later. But this is certainly a great way to start your first foray into weighting a character using all these different tool sets. If you have any questions, let me know.